welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Max, he, him or they, them pronouns. I'm from the Groningen branch, been a member for a few years and I was invited to give a talk today on um, identity politics and the struggle for LGBTQIA liberation. I have to be honest, I'm kind of going off that very specific script a little bit. I'm slightly broadening it also to talk about um, things like um, <laughs> things like uh, racial liberation and the struggle against sexism, so women's liberation for example. So I think these things all in the concepts that we're going to be discussing like they overlap and interlink a lot so yeah I found it really difficult to just kind of like keep it on this one subject. Um, so my idea today is not to give you like the most comprehensive collective or kind of collection of arguments and the in, in, ins and outs of identity politics um, but more of a kind of like conversation starter, a bit of history, a couple of like Marxist positions um, so and then the focus as always will be on the discussion. So if you have any questions, like write them down and I want you to also discuss amongst each other later, not just towards me. Um, so I will repeat this a few times because I don't want anyone kind of misunderstanding or misconstruing what I'm saying, but if I uh, criticize identity politics to some extent, I'm not criticizing that people find empowerment in marginalized identities. Um, like that's a process that is really important and that happens and that's also something that, that I do. Like I identify as queer and gay and these like identities give me a lot of power and a lot of strength. Um, but we'll kind of get to like the ins and outs of that later. Um, and I also want to make clear that like I think from our perspective the struggle against racism will be led by people of color, the struggle against sexism will be led by women, etc, etc. But I think from Marx's position it is like we want to make the argument that marginalized communities can't be the only people struggling against these things but that these need to be collective processes, right? Um, so when I critique identity politics in the talk today, I'm not meaning to say that marginalized communities don't exist, that their voices or actions don't matter. Like it's actually the opposite. Like what this whole point down boils down to, or what the kind of synopsis I guess is that um, we should be argue or that this is a critique of politics of separation, um, and that we should be striving towards more politics of solidarity and, and interaction and collective action. So the aim of the talk, in a way, is to give you the histories and continu continuities of identity politics and also connected to that uh, privilege theory, which we'll be talking about later, and kind of give you what I call like a measured Marxist criticism of these concepts. Um, and I want to give you some kind of like the beginnings of roadmaps to liberations that are based on solidarity and not separation. So I always try to start this kind of talks off by trying to contextualize things a little bit, where like, slightly short on time, I think, because I have a lot to talk about. Um, I was going to give you a whole kind of thing on like all of the things that are wrong in society at the moment, but I think you being here in this room means that you probably already like grasp that like the realities that like racism is rampant, transphobia is rampant and exists and keeps to like continuously is pushed into society by the far right um, and uh, also by the kind of political center. Um, that the rights of uh, migrants and Muslims are under attack constantly by politicians who use them as scapegoats. Um, that the working class in general is in a like dire position when it comes to all sorts of things, um, struggling for higher wages. Um, there's like the rent struggle and all these kind of things. So there's lots of things that need to that need to change, and I think we all are in agreement of that. Um, and a lot of people like share that feeling, right? So there's a lot of like very young people, teenagers, or people that that are also encounter at uni that seemingly can tell you all about identity liberation, about intersectionality, feminism, decolonial perspectives. Um, and that's really great. At the same time, you often see, at least I often see that like there's a lot of kind of like very radical sounding words and veneers. And when you actually dig deeper, the conclusions that these people often come to are very like centrist, liberal, or at best reformist. And then it's kind of like a question, like people know these terms like intersectionality and they like throw them around. Um, but then they come to really like reformist conclusions in the end, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a process that like, I hope that we can kind of get into that in discussion later a little bit. Um, so, yeah, terms like intersectionally are thrown around a lot, which is it's actually a great term, but I think it's depoliticized in a lot of ways. Um, and in, in a lot of the like liberal left, or what I call kind of the, radi the radical liberals maybe, um, there's a lot of kind of like uh, focus on that. There's workshops on checking your privilege, unlearning unconscious biases. Um, we kind of see divisions of like people into either privileged or underprivileged. Um, and these tend to sometimes, I mean, and like, some spaces these are like very like seem to be very clear cut concepts rather than like it's more seeming like a spectrum or something like this. Um, 
And like what we often hear is that kind of privileged people have no interest in fighting oppression, that they have no interest in um, like uh, in fighting the system and like overcoming these things and that in a way they need to sit down and be quiet. But then also we often hear that like privileged people need to stand up and use their voices and like be more visible, which is kind of like there's a lot of contradictions in these kind of political circles, I think. Um, and then we hear things like, okay, you know, sometimes, you, like I already said, this kind of radical sounding stuff, like the whole system needs to change. And you're like, yeah, the whole system needs to change. And then in the end, people that say that are like, yeah, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, you know, like a new, like, a new beginning, or they will post some kind of like, yes, a clever fan fiction or something like this. And you're just kind of like, what? Um, where did that come from? You know, where did this stuff that you just talked about go? Um, and I think part of that is the kind of like deeper, political under implications of, of some of these theories that don't really equip people with uh, a way of struggling against the systems on a like deeper level. Um, and out, on, all these on these grounds we also see a lot of new kind of separatist, separatist sentiments growing. So there is more of a, a re-emergence of kind of uh, queer separation or ideas of queer separation that we need to kind of like focus on ourselves first and then we can kind of like fight capitalism. There's also ideas of Afro-pessimism and black separatist politics that are kind of like emerging again, which seem to have been um, kind of away from the political landscape for like 30, 40 years. So they're kind of re-emerging now. Um, there's also like the far right talking about identity politics. Um, they will use it as a kind of like, you know, a, like a, our freedom of speech is threatened because of identity politics or something like this. And I also don't want to get into that too much, but I think you all kind of know the arguments, right? Like the left is threatening freedom of speech. It's all about minorities now and the poor oppressed white people like can't get anything anymore, right? And like that's obviously something that we want to reject as well. I don't think I need to go into too much detail on that. Um, there's also like an interest in socialism in general and Marxism in particular, which is why a lot of you are here. If you don't know that that's what this is about, you're probably in the like, wrong venue. Um, somebody's like, shit. Um, uh, and like that's important that we as Marxists kind of see like and are able to engage with a lot of the kind of questions and the social movements that that are important to people and to their individual lives and experiences unfortunately what we see is that a lot of marxist groups seem to be horrible at like answering the questions of people when it comes to uh, ideas of racial liberation or gender liberation there's a lot of kind of um vulgar kind of marxist projects that that will kind of like say um oh well you know the, like the struggle for like racial liberation and gender liberation and sexual liberation that's kind of stuff like divisive identity politics and we need to focus on the revolution and after like the revolution comes and then everything will kind of like fall into place and i think that's not our tradition and i don't think that's an authentic marxist tradition again we'll come to to talk about that a little bit later but it's it's quite sad because marxists believe that like the working class with all of, its, all of its diversity can rise up and create a society in our own interest and that um, we can defeat racism and that we can overcome sexism and these kind of things. Um, and that's why it's so important for us to like talk about this in these kind of settings to know what kind of arguments we should use um, towards the politics of liberation. Um, so what, leave, what this leaves us with is on one hand like a situation where um, the kind of like radical liberal or that are kind of like liberal left spaces, I suppose, um, kind of have a lot of focus on, on cultural spheres, which are often really important, but they kind of, that's their end point, right? So like, rather than like building like larger projects, they say, we need to focus on cultural change and that's it. And, or maybe kind of questioning people's interactions with each other, which is important, but again, not an end point. And on the other hand, we have um, a weakness of the Marxist left to really give good answers and a lot of what Lenin called economism, so this kind of like idea that we need to struggle on economic, or that we need to focus on economic struggles first and foremost, and that everything else will kind of come with that. And I think neither of these options kind of either represent like an authentic Marxist tradition or give us like a roadmap of where we need to go and in which direction to fight if we want to overcome uh, oppressions. So let's, let's look at identity politics a bit closer. Um, and uh, I'll like start to kind of situate it in, in history a little bit and, and I'll try to make a definition of it. It's a bit difficult to really define it in one or two sentences because um, what people mean when they talk about identity politics is often very different. So some people just refer, use identity politics to refer to a kind of left-wing progressive focus on social struggles, uh, on struggles of marginalized people. And some additionally also think that it's a kind of like, 
high focus on social identities and people's self-identification. So like, yeah, if somebody like really like identifies as a queer person, and I'll be like, oh, you know, it's just some identity politics stuff or something like this. Um, but there's often also um, this kind of idea, and I think it is a feature of identity politics to some extent of kind of giving political support to people because of their identity, right? So celebration of women in top positions because they are women, or like a kind of an argument to vote for women because they're women. This was like really prevalent, for example, with the election of like Hillary, or like the electoral campaign of Hillary Clinton. Um, but we also have these kind of campaigns in the Netherlands where it's really like, um, there's a diversion away from political content and more towards like what are the experiences and identities of people um, and we should like support them based on these identities. Um, but I think it boils down to is that today identity politics is a kind of collector, a collection of strategies, focus points, and analyses that indeed center the experiences of identities of marginalized people. Um, and typically people that subscribe to identity politics will see um, the development and strengthening of identities and kind of specific cultural spaces of marginalized people as the main or primary side of struggle. And I think that's the point, like we're not against or we shouldn't be against uh, marginalized people kind of finding their own cultural spaces or identities, but that the focus on this being like a primary struggle in itself, uh, maybe along with some like ideas of consciousness raising, I think that's what kind of like is the, is the kind of like critical point of like what makes identity politics identity politics. Um, if we want to situate it a bit more historically, this kind of set of politics has its birthplace in the 60s and 70s. It also developed throughout the 80s and 90s, like this is not just like a fixed moment, but I think that's where it kind of emerged. There's the second, second wave, famous second wave feminist assertion that the personal is political, which is actually like a formulation that was started as a really radical concept, right? It's saying that um, what we may experience as individuals and what maybe feels like just my own thing or something like this is actually like a collective process that a lot of people are experiencing. So it had a kind of really radical assertion in the beginning. One of the most central groups in the verbalization of identity politics and kind of really defining it was the Kumbahi River Collective, which is uh, or was a collective of black lesbian feminists that are also kind of standing in the Marxist tradition or at least had strong Marxist influences. They issued the statement, um, a statement on their politics in 1977 um, and they identified identity politics as, um, I quote, the focus or this focusing upon our own oppression is embodied in the concept of identity politics. We believe that the most profound and potential for potentially most radical politics come directly out of our own identity as opposed to working to end somebody else's oppression. Similarly, there were other um, second wave feminists, uh, for example, Judith Brown and Beverly Jones, who um, published a manifesto called Toward a Female Liberation Movement, in which they said, people don't get rad radicalized fighting other people's struggles, and therefore women must uh, form their own group and work primarily for female liberation only. Which is quite strange and in many ways I think contradictory because if you look back at the like 60s, 70s, a lot of people were radicalized by struggles that were not about themselves specifically, right? There was uh, mass movements against the Vietnam War, people were witnessing the struggle for black liberation, were immensely inspired by it, uh, queer people for example were witnessing the struggle um, uh, for women's liberation, we're really inspired by it. There were like whole protest movements inspired by post-colonial movements or like um, uh, anti-colonial revolutions. So it seems like there was a period of a flowering of solidarity, but there was no really like no force that was able to really put this in like a framework of solidarity. So what happened seems or what seems to have happened is that there was a splintering um, of political approaches. Um, and also, like, it's just, it was a reality that the, the needs and voices of people of color, of women and queer people were continued to be marginalized and also kind of left spaces, specifically silentness spaces um, and reformist spaces. And out of this frustration of being constantly marginalized, even in like left spaces, grew a kind of defeatism, right? And that defeatism said that actually unity is not possible. That what we have to focus on is our own identity and with that also need, needs to come a kind of degree of separation. Uh, in the 80s, queer theorists also asserted that queer liberation is fundamentally about separation, that you can't exist as a queer person in society unless you kind of make your own separate spaces and you kind of build your own better world or something like this. Um, so what we saw there, and, and collectively this kind of means that there's a move away from, um, from really struggling for like total liberation rather than 
fighting against capitalism as a whole and against class society, you struggled only against homophobia, for example. And it's a turning away from uh, viewing the working class as a whole as a revolutionary subject and just kind of seeing liberation as like a personal process. I mean, this was again kind of developing over time in different directions. But for example, in the, in the kind of gay movement, coming out was turned to be like a political move, which I think it can be. But it's not part of a larger strategy. It was seen as like it became the end of like in itself, right? So like coming out is the most radical political act, and just existing makes you revolutionary. And that's something that we often hear still today, right? Like us existing is a revolutionary act, and I kind of get the sentiment because so many of us in marginalized spaces or communities don't make it. Um, but at the same time, is that existence actually enough to overthrow capitalism? And I think my answer to that would be no. So I think that's sometimes an oversimplification in this area. Um, and that was reflected at this time already. Um, so we saw a rejection of seeing capitalism as a source of sexism or queer oppression or racism, instead of focus on seeing, for example, men, white people, straight people as the kind of primary perpetrators and also the primary objects of oppression or like the, 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 the subjects of oppression actually, like the people that commit the oppression, right? So it's not the systems, but it's people. Um, and at first glance, it makes a lot of sense because I think a lot of the oppressions that we do experience, we experience them like from a homophobe yelling at me from across the street or something like this, right? Or something like this. It's very abstract to say, oh, well, the concept of the family is kind of like, you know, uh, over millennia, um, these kind of forms of oppression are like kind of layered into society and all of these kind of things. So it seems very abstract and it makes a lot of sense that people would like see the homophobe from across the street as the like most direct expression of it but i think yeah it's a bit more complicated than than that so um uh, that's also where um radical feminism developed the idea of patriarchy ther uh, theory so that it's not capitalism or feudalism or so so class society at large that led to the oppression of women but it is the kind of manhood itself right so that there's something inherent in men that have a drive to domination have a drive for violence and that that out of that grows patriarchy and it sounds pretty abstract as well, I think, but it's also something that's still around a lot, like if you kind of follow a lot of postmodern theory and uh, postcolonial theory kind of to the end points, you also find that there is no real explanation for why racism exists and then often the implication is maybe that there's a kind of inherent European quality to domination and to colonialism or something like this and there's like a struggle of really finding answers to this, so I think what it often leans into is this kind of like essentializing of racism almost like it's almost something inherent in humans and there's an essentializing of sexism I think because basically these people say well as a manhood itself it's always been like this and there's no real way of changing right like we can't do anything so out of that also grew like separatist projects who you know there were feminist group who said you have to give away custody for male children because you can't have the oppressor in your house even as a child or something like this I mean these are extreme forms and they like fell flat as political projects but you can kind of see where some of these kind of political continu continuities started. Um, so in separatist ideologies, the main um, division in society is not between the working class and the bourgeoisie, but between the oppressed minorities and privileged majorities. Um, and yeah, what happens often is what I already said, it's a kind of high level of reduction of systemic realities of oppression into like down to interpersonal interactions that people have with each other. Um, one of the kind of key things that came out of these kind of early, I call it identitarian movements, there's also a different connotation with that, but like these identity politic movements is the focus on consciousness raising, because the only real tangible thing that you can do when you have this kind of like worldview is try to talk to people and kind of raise their consciousness and say, okay, maybe you can reject your privilege or you can kind of maybe change the way of interacting. And to some extent, of course, it's important that people change the way that they interact with each other. But again, like to see it as a kind of endpoint in itself, I think is, is problematic and something that's still super prevalent. And I think that's kind of where the idea of privilege theory links in. Um, so with this kind of system, like when the kind of systemic analyses and the materialist analyses of where oppression comes from and how it's maintained and, and these kind of things, when that was falling away, we needed a new way of, exp or there was a need for a new way of explaining oppression um, and, and how it operates. And that's when Privilege theory kind of came into the into the into the play and was um, and was popularized. Uh, I think to start off with here, I also want to say again that like 
if I if I criticize this concept, it doesn't mean that socialists on, on everyone shouldn't reflect about the ways in which oppression affects themselves or how other people in their lives are um, affected by oppression or maybe also the things that we didn't have to go through whereas comrades of ours and friends of ours um, and people in society in general had to go through. I think that's like that we need to do that in order to learn uh, how to communicate and how to create comradely spaces and how to create um, ways of struggling. I still have time, right? Yeah, five minutes. Yeah, five ten, minutes? Ten, ten, ten minutes? Ten okay. Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, okay, um, like we should reflect about these things, right? Like the, the point if I criticize uh, privilege theory is not about like us thinking about how we stand in the world and like what things we don't have to face and what things we have to struggle with, but it's about kind of like raising like privilege theory essentially is this idea that was um, popularized by uh, postmodern scholars, in particular a person called Peggy McIntosh, who said that oppression primarily operates through that, right? So primarily oppression operates through what she called an in invisible knapsack, so um, of privileges that were given to people. So for example, m men get the privilege uh, of being able to walk on the streets safe at night or something like this if they're cis and if they're white and etc right um uh and like um straight people are given given a privilege of kind of like having marriage equality or something like this right or kind of like a sense of self safety um so the idea is that um you're given something and you have an interest in maintaining this kind of like hegemonic system and the system of oppression because you get a bonus right um and in a way this, this, well, this kind of refers back to an earlier argument that was made by a black historian and socialist W.E.B. Du Bois, and he had this concept of a psychological wage, and his argument was that in post-Civil War reconstruction society in, 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 the, um, in America, there was a period where white workers were given an, an additional psychological wage. He says they were given um, public titles of courtesy because they were white, they were admitted freely with all... Uh, with all classes of white people to public functions, public parks, and the best schools. The police were drawn from their ranks, and the courts depended on their votes, treated them with such leniency as to encourage lawlessness. So this quote is actually accurate, and we'll get back to it later. Um, but there's a couple of like issues with the kind of high focus on understanding oppression mainly as operating through privilege. Um, it again focuses kind of interpersonal behaviors and interactions of people, which again makes sense out of the context that I said earlier, um, because that's where we primarily experience, uh, or it seems like that's where we primarily experience oppression. Um, but it's also kind of raising things that should be the norm, for example, being safe at night, or like having access to healthcare, or having access to education as a kind of like additional thing. The most extreme, there were some feminist groups who, for example, argued that uh, women are not underpaid, but that men are actually overpaid. So in order to close the wage gap, we need to like lower men's <laughs> wages because it's a bonus that's given to them because they're men. I mean, it's, it's almost comical, but like that was a real argument of like some feminist splinter groups. But like, you know, like there, there we can kind of see like the continuation of this argument. Um, okay. Um, so... Okay, it also to some extent takes away the uh, reality of oppression, right? So rather than saying transphobia is a reality of oppression, it kind of frames it as a, it's a, like there's a, there's privileges given to cis people and it's like a bonus given rather than like something's being taken away from other people. Um, and I think that kind of changes the, the focus a little bit on where we should, where we should struggle. So in combination of identity politics and privilege theory, what we often see is an assertion that only oppressed people can understand their own oppression and only those who are directly affected uh, by it can find ways of liberation or have any interest in it. So the argument is, for example, that cis people can never know what it's like being oppressed based on your gender identity, which is true, but at the same time it says, because of that you enjoy privileges, because of that you have no motivation to fight the system, because of that the only people who can struggle for gender liberation are queer and trans people, and there's no place for cis people in the struggle for queer liberation, right? So like this is the kind of like continuation of this argument. We often hear these kind of phrases like listen to X people, like listen to trans people or something like this thrown around and that's really true, like we need to listen to trans people but at the same time it becomes more complicated when you realize that actually these groups are not five minutes? Okay. These groups are not um, like 
hom homogenous, but that there are different people with different political ideas and different economic situations and different experiences in these groups. And like, what we often see is this kind of idea like, okay, because these people experience this uh, oppression, they must know the way to liberation, and that's why we need to give them support. And I would say we need to give trans people support, but we need to also think about giving the people that align with our political analyses and our political frameworks that are part of these communities support, right? So um, listen to, not just to any person of a marginalized group, but say listen to Marxist trans women, like listen to Marxist black people about their oppression and their struggles and these kind of things, right? So we need to like sharpen the, the idea about, about that a little bit because I think otherwise it leads to a lot of tokenism, the kind of assumption that you must know the truth because you're part of this identity. Um, and actually the Marxist argument is also that, that everyone has an, has an interest in fighting oppression, right? So for me, I have an interest in fighting sexism because I think it will destroy like the, the systems of, of gender violence that we know. And there is a definite direct high interest for women in fighting sexism, but I think the whole working class uh, and everyone will, will, will like, uh, benefit from overcoming patriarchy and systems of gendered violence, for example. Um, so one of the kind of points here is that um, these like the struggles for identities and like uh, and and liberation on that basis can be starting points for radicalization, but they shouldn't be end points. There's a black lesbian Marxist scholar called Bell Hooks who wrote on the topic, and she basically said that. Um, it is necessary for feminists to stress the ability to see and describe one's own reality, um, but it is only a beginning. And she says that when women start to internalize the idea that describing their own um, like struggle was synonymous with developing critical perspectives, um, the, the whole feminist movement and its development was stalled because like you can only go so far with that idea. Um, so slogans like organize around your own oppression actually provided an excuse for a lot of people to not participate, for example, in struggles for li racial liberation, because they were like, well, I'm a white woman, so I'm gonna struggle, like focus on my struggle here and that's it. Or maybe at least kind of give like nominal support to other struggles, but they weren't part of these struggles anymore. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit because I need to round up pretty soon. <laughs> um, so uh, I think I wanna make a case for Marxism. <laughs> Surprise, surprise. Um, and basically, my argument is that we need to, we need more than experiences, we need political theory, right? Um, Marx said there's this quote that like, all science would be superfluous if the outward appearance of things and the essence of things directly coincided. So if things were as easy as they seem, like we wouldn't be sitting here, right? If people understood their oppression based on their experiences, we wouldn't have to need, we wouldn't have to have these kind of talks because, yeah, it would be done, like, there wouldn't be any oppression probably. Um, we start from a point of uh, materialism, so we think that we need to like look at the, the forces that create society and then maintain structures of oppression. Um, and we think that like fundamental change can only come about if we really uh, go to the roots of these issues, right? We see the primary discuss the, the primary um, uh, uh, like place of struggle in society as between being between the working class and, and uh, the capitalist class. But for us, it's always important to say that the working class is not just straight and white and male. It is also straight and white and male, but it's also black and gay and trans and has all sorts of religious identities and all of these kind of things. And that the working class is a collective interest to overcome oppression. Um, so now I'm thinking if I should, well, if I should round off completely and just give it to the, to the floor. Um, I think I'm just going to quickly just try to really briefly kind of make a point for solidarity. Um, I think the idea like the idea that we have about racism and the roots of it and etc and also about sexism are very deep and we can discuss it more at length in the discussion but I think one of the points that I want to re-emphasize again is that in our analysis and our idea um, these systems of oppression damage the whole working class. They create disunity and they are there to create disunity and they are there to legitimize the oppression of specifically marginalized people but actually that has a backlash on all of us. So what seems to be a privilege for people to be able to go to school safely or something or to receive an education is actually used by the capitalist class as a kind of like, like as a petty privilege, right? It's given, it's the idea that like, um, we have a bigger slice of the pie, like for example, white works have a big slice of the pie because 
black works have a small slice of the pie, but what's actually the picture if you zoom out is that the capitalist takes 98% or 95% of the pie and then says, you know, oh, you two need to fight amongst each other um, and you, you have to blame each other when actually our interests uh, coincide and when, they're un then when united we have the power to really um, fight the system and change the world. Yeah, I need to round up. So, um, so that's why my, 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 my point is that an authentic Marxism uh, centers the struggle against racism, centers the struggle against homophobia and against sexism because all of these things are um, detrimental to the, to the unity of the working class and that only together we can overcome the systems of oppression. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.